Turn with me, let me see, to the book of John. No, to the book of Matthew. I got the wrong place in my Bible here. In the book of Matthew, chapter 11, verses 28 to 30. Now read announcements while you're finding your place. Just remember our announcements. Uh, I'd like to say again, we had a good work day yesterday, or fr Friday it was. I'm still used to having work day on Saturday, I guess. <laughs> and uh, appreciate all the help. Uh, let's remember uh, Wednesday nights, we're in the sixth chapter of, of Timothy, the last chapter of 1 Timothy. And so we'll uh, probably conclude that Wednesday night. Uh, March the 2nd is our next work day, again at 10 o'clock. To see after church today, this uh, start this afternoon is Super Bowl. We invite everybody to come over to my house and watch Super Bowl. And let's see, elders, let's remember Saturday is our meeting. So all the, the Board of Elders will be meeting next Saturday. And uh, the Black Bear Jeff. Huh? The Black Bear Diner? Yes. Okay. Black Bear Diner. What time? What time? 12 o'clock noon. Okay. I'll be there. February 21 is the is when we're going to have the uh, annual, I guess you call it a planning service. Uh, we used to call it a business meeting, but uh, we kind of changed our format in our church. So but it'll be a time to discuss the coming year and and what we have planned for the year and so forth. And let's remember the, uh, the rodeo, the June the 18th. Before the rodeo though, one announcement that I haven't been making, that it's time to start making, is the National Day of Prayer. And that's always the first Thursday of uh, May. And that'll be at the uh, community hall in Dayton at uh, I don't remember now for God, if we're going to start at 6.30 or 7. 6.30, I believe it is. But anyway, we always have a good time, and a lot of churches is going to be represented this. This is a, a, a function of the uh, Dayton Ministerial Association. So if you can make it out that night for a day of prayer, I know that in the city of Carson they have their uh, prayer what do you call it? Uh, vigil? Yeah. <laughs> uh, they have theirs at noon on uh, the day of prayer every year. Uh, that way people can come down during their lunch break, but uh, a lot of people can't make that, and I like our evening having it. So with the two, you can make one of them, hopefully. Uh, July 4th, we'll be going to the uh, We'll be doing the, the uh, fireworks at Moffat Park. I announced the rodeo, right? 18, let's see, $8, or 9 and $12, right, Andy? Yeah. 9 and $12. $9 for, for uh, young and old. <laughs> young and old for the, the children and senior citizens is uh, $9, and everybody else is $12. I think that's money well spent. I really enjoy that rodeo every year. It's, uh, it's a lot of fun. They're, they do a lot of things. Up. It's been said by a lot of people that it's the best rodeo in, in the United States. Uh, it is really a good rodeo. They do such good things. So let's remember these announcements and uh, uh, participate in as much as you can. Okay, let me get this out of the way. And let us stand this morning as we read our text in Matthew chapter 11 and verses 28 and 30. The, uh, Jesus said, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Father, we come before you this morning. We ask, Lord, for your presence this morning. I ask, Lord, for your anointing and for your blessings on this message. <coughs> Lord, that's my desire to bring forth your word and to minister to each one that's here. 
So, Lord, I need you, and I need your inspiration and your presence. And so I just pray that your perfect will would be done. And I pray and ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated if you wish. I, I look at this scripture, and, you know, it just dawned on me one time when I was reading this, and some other scripture I want to share with you this morning uh, of what Jesus was really saying here. He was saying, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. What is he going to live us, give us rest from? He, give us, he gives us rest from the burdens that we, uh, that we have to bear in our lives. And as we read uh, a little later, he says, take my yoke upon you. Now, you know, I, I think a lot of people get the wrong idea, and I think a lot of preachers preach the wrong message when it comes to uh, our relationship with Christ because we find that as we read the Bible and, and look through the whole Bible, we find that it's not, Jesus is not a great big Santa Claus that just gives everybody everything they need and, and there's nothing to be done in return. And, and so forth and so that's what what even in this scripture right here come unto me all you that labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest but he didn't say that I'm going to take away every problem you have I'm going to make your life completely easy for you so that you can just kick back and relax and and I'm just going to take care of everything for you that isn't what the gospel's about. That's not what our relationship with the Lord is about. It really isn't. Our, our relationship with the Lord is about having a better life. But in, in doing so, we have an obligation to do our part in this relationship. And uh, we find in the Bible that uh, the Apostle Paul, he compares our relationship with the Lord in the same way that the relationship uh, should be between a man and his wife. And if you're going to have a good marriage and a good home, the husband and the wife both has to do their part to make it a good home and, and to have the things that they enjoy and enjoy one another and, and all these things. And I'll tell you something that I think is a, is a major mistake that a lot of uh, married couples make is they get into an attitude of competition with one another. Uh, and one tries to outdo the other or better the other or take advantage of the other one and, and things like that. But you know what? A man and his wife needs to love each other and work together for the betterment of the whole family. And it's that way in our relationship with Christ. Uh, he will always do his part. We don't have to ever worry about that. And so if we do our part and accept the things that he uh, puts into the relationship and so forth, we can have a great life and so forth. But we all will always have a yoke to bear. We will always have a yoke to bear. And that's what he said here. Take my yoke upon you. You know what a yoke is? Does everybody know what a yoke is? A yoke is what went around the, the, the neck of the oxen when they pulled the plow or pulled the wagon or whatever. And they pulled against that in order to pull the weight of that wagon or that plow or whatever the, the, uh, the work that needed to be accomplished. And so the yoke, we all have a yoke in this life. And uh, even before we're saved, we have a yoke. And, and uh, there's uh, always uh, problems and situations in our lives. Uh, but you know what? Before we get saved, before we commit our life to Christ, our problems are a lot greater and our yoke is a lot harder to pull than it is after we're saved. And so he said, take my yoke upon you or, or take the easy yoke, the easy load uh, to bear. Uh, and here's, and I like the next phrase there in verse 29. After he said, take my yoke upon you, he said, learn of me, learn of me. And that's a, a, a big factor in having a good relationship with God is for us to learn about him and to to really understand what he's about and what he expects from us and what we can expect from him and so forth so 
learn of me and learn my way. And I was thinking uh, about uh, the scripture that is so popular and used so much, probably the most well-known, I don't know if it's the most uh, well-known scripture in the Bible, but I'm thinking about John 3.16. Uh, and I don't know if that one is, 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 is better known than the 23rd Psalm or not, but I would imagine the two are probably close uh, uh, in how much they're, that they are, are known. And so, uh, the Bible said, Whosoever believeth on him shall not perish. Well, what does that mean, to believe on him? Well, it said, For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth on him. Now what exactly does that mean? Does that mean to, to believe that he exists? Is that what that means? I don't think so. I think it means a great deal more than that. There's a lot of people that believes in the existence of Christ that's not even saved and knows nothing about him. And, uh, and so their knowledge that he once existed is, is actually no benefit to them whatsoever. Uh, but whosoever believeth on him, I think what that is talking about, I think it means that whosoever believes and accepts the teachings that he brought and applies them to their lives. Now there's a lot of teachings and, and I've heard people talk about the gospel of Christ and, and uh, we normally relate the, the term gospel to getting saved, you know, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. But I believe it goes further than that. I believe once we're saved, then we have a relationship and we have uh, kind of like having rules and things that we must follow. And I know that there's a lot of people, and we knew back in the, in the 60s there was a movement in America called the hippie movement, and uh, present company accepted. And, uh, <laughs> So, we, uh, uh, they, they, it was an act of rebellion in most cases where they was rebelling against the establishment because they did not want to follow any rules at all. Well, I want to tell you, there was a lot of disaster that came from that movement. There really was. And uh, I, I know of situations where uh, these young people would camp especially up in uh, the northern uh, country, north, uh, northern California and up in Oregon around, and they'd go out and just camp by streams, and, and, uh, and they'd wash their clothes in the, in the stream, and downstream from there, people was taking the water out to drink and cook with, and, and so people was getting sick, and there was all kinds of problems that, was, that came about from uh, the way that they lived and so forth, because they didn't want anybody to tell them what to do. They wanted to be on their own and, and just do their own thing and, and so forth. Well, I tell you, in this life, I don't care who you are, uh, you're going to have rules to go by and, and, uh, and procedures and different things. And what would happen if they just threw away all the, the, the rules for driving a car down the road. Everybody just go do whatever you want to do. You don't have to stop at a red light, just blade, just go on through or stop sign and uh, drive as fast as you want. You just do anything you want to do. What would happen out there? Well, there'd be a lot of car wrecks and people getting killed and all kinds of things. So there's a reason why that we have these things. And when we live for the Lord, then we have a situation where that we have some rules and some guidelines to live our lives by. Uh, the Bible says one of the rules is to love your neighbors yourself. Now, you might say, well, that sounds like a really good thing. Wow, especially if I'm on the receiving side of this. What a wonderful thing that is. But, you know, to love your neighbor like yourself is uh, its not always easy to do. I've had a couple of times I've had neighbors that... Uh, and they wasn't so easy to love. And I, I just, one comes to my mind is in the first house that I bought, I had a neighbor and the lady in that house, and no matter how hard we tried, we just could not get along with that lady. I mean, it was something else. She ended up buying our house from us, but anyway, <laughs> so that solved the problems. 
but uh, come unto me, learn of me. And then he went ahead and said, I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. So if, if he's meek and lowly, and you learn from him, or learn of him, by him, or however you want to take that phrase, then uh, you'll find that becoming meek and lowly like he was is going to solve a lot of problems in your life. Did you know that? Just by being meek and lowly, it's going to solve... That means you've got to get rid of a lot of pride and, and self-worth maybe and, and some things like that. And you have to become the kind of an individual that Jesus was. And so he was our example and we need to pattern our life after him. His whole life uh, was, was all about ministering to others. That's what Jesus' life was about. Ministering to life. And, uh, ministering to others and then at the end of his life he ended his life by giving himself on the cross that you and I could be saved paying the debt of sin that you and I owed and so uh, I like that course that we sang this morning he paid a debt he did not owe I owed a debt I could not pay uh, and it was all motivated by love and he was concerned and that another song we sang this morning talked about uh, that uh, even on the cross he remembered and still ministered to people as he was dying as he was up there and his life was coming to an end he still remembered the fellow beside him uh, and said today you shall be with me in paradise and so I you know sometime I think I may preach a, a, a sermon on that because that's really an interesting story about that and there's more to that than what most people think there is and so we need to recognize the love of Christ and how, uh, how great that he is. I want to go to some scripture in the book of John, chapter 8. Uh, and I want to begin at verse 30. And I want to uh, read these words when Jesus had a conversation with the Pharisees and the Sadducees, I believe it was. And uh, as he... Uh, spoke here in John chapter 8 and starting in verse 30 and I'm going to go down quite a few verses it says as he spoke these words many believed on him then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him if you continue in my word then are you my disciples indeed so you see there here's another condition another rule if uh, uh, if, if you will uh, he said to the Jews that believed on him. See, see there's, there's more to this than just believing. There's more to it. He, he said to the Jews that believed on him, how many has heard from the Lord, uh, uh, the, the Lord speaking to you to do something or to change something in your life or something after you've been saved? How many has done that? Just me? No, <laughs> I'm sure we've all been serving the Lord very long. The Lord talks to you because... He wants you to be the best person possible, and He's going to live with you and give you direction and guidance and help you to be the very best person that you can possibly be. Now, I know of a lot of parents, in fact, I think just about all parents, they want their children to be the best that they can be. And uh, I've, I've heard people say, uh, I, I want my children to have more than what I've had when I was growing up. I just want them to have uh, better things and, uh, and so forth. You know, it's always been my desire and, and my goal uh, for my children to be better Christians than what I am. That's what I want for my kids. Uh, there's a scripture, and I'm going by memory here. I don't remember exactly how it's worded. I believe it's in the book of Titus where uh, Paul wrote Titus, and he said something to the effect that there is nothing that pleases him more than to see his children serving the Lord. Mm -hmm. and, and he was talking about his spiritual children. I, I don't think the Apostle Paul had any biological children. I'm not sure about that. The Bible really doesn't say, but I don't really think he did. It's just from what we read uh, about him. So in John chapter 8 and verse 30, it says, As he spoke these words, many believed on him, then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, 
Now these are believers. If you continue in my word, then are you my disciple. It means student. Student. So if you're a disciple of the Lord, that means you're a student, and that means that you are learning about the Lord or learning from the Lord. And, uh, and so we need to realize that because we are, in fact, his disciples when we get saved. And so as we continue here, and Jesus said, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. I get the idea that when Jesus made that statement that he was saying that they had not uh, arrived at enough truth or the, the amount of truth that they needed to have in their lives. They needed to find out more truth. I, I know an organization, a Christian organization, that uh, they, there's something that they say real regular, on a real regular basis, and they say, uh, we preach the truth, and they always talking about the truth, the truth. But they're only referring to one thing when they make that statement, and it's always about the same thing that they're talking about uh, when they make that statement, and it's their plan of salvation, what they believe the Bible teaches about getting saved. And that's what they're always talking about, about the truth. Well, I, I want to tell them when I hear that, I just want to tell them there's a lot more truth in the Bible than that. Uh, the Bible is full of truth. The whole Bible is truth. And so we need to know many things in the Bible and find out what, it's, what the message that it has uh, uh, for us. And so when Jesus said, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free, they responded to his words and they said, they answered him, we be Abraham's seed and were never in bondage to any man. Uh, how sayest thou... Uh, you shall be made free. Word to, I'm missing something here, aren't I? I'm missing something here. Anyway, uh, Jesus spoke about them being free. He said, uh, he, he spoke the words that the Son would make you free. Uh, how does that go? <laughs> that scripture, uh, it says that, uh, I missed, a, I missed a verse. Let's see if I can find it in the Bible because it's really important. Verse 30. Uh, What's 32? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Okay, yeah, I did have that there, didn't I? Mm -hmm. The truth shall make you free. Okay. I just want to be sure that. Uh, so when he said that the truth would make them free, they had a, an interesting response, and they never really understood what he was talking about. Because they said, uh, we're Abraham's seed, and we're never in bondage to any man. How sayest then, you shall be made free? Uh, was that a correct statement that they made? No, it was not. It was not a correct statement. If you'll read the history of the nation Israel, and you look in the Old Testament, they was in bondage many times to neighboring countries and so forth. Betty Sue has shared a lot of that in her lessons for the children. Uh, they was in bondage in Egypt for over 400 years. Uh, they was uh, in bondage 70 years in Babylon. They had been in bondage to the Midianites and the Philistines. And at the present time that they spoke this, they was actually in bondage to the Roman Empire. So to say we've never been in bondage to anybody, uh, so uh, that is really kind of a, a, a really a false statement, isn't it? When I, I remember preaching this many years ago, probably 50 years ago, I preached this message in, in uh, Kermit, Texas, to a little church there. Actually, it was, to me, a fairly good-sized church. Had about, oh, they had over 200 people. Uh, in that church and so I was on vacation and stopped by and seen the pastor which was a friend of mine and and he had me preach for him and and when I was uh, uh, preaching I made the statement I said that uh, they, they, they said they was never in bondage to anybody I said their forefathers had been in bondage 
many times. Well, they told me, the pastor told me later, we went by his house after service and had some refreshments and, and so forth. And so uh, the pastor, he started laughing and he told me, he said, he said, John on the way home, as we was driving home from church, he said, uh, called his daughter's name. She was about five years old, I think, at that time. And she said, Dad, she said, I, I, I know Brother John knows what he was preaching, but how can somebody have four fathers? <laughs> so, I, I, I'll, I'll always remember that. She was a cute little girl, but uh, she's over 50 years old now. But <laughs> anyway, this is very interesting setting of Scripture. And uh, he said, uh, uh, so uh, as we look at this, I'd like to look at some of the things that people are in bondage today. Uh, let's read verse 34. Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. Now, how many knows that to really be true? That's really true, isn't it? That if, if you're in sin... That sin controls your life. It really does. And I'm going to name some things that people are in bondage today. Uh, as we look in our society, there's a lot of things that people get in bondage to. And uh, I'm, I have a list of things, and you could probably add to this. But there's people today that's in bondage to drugs. People are in bondage to tobacco, alcohol. Pornography, television, you be quiet, Linda. <laughs> uh, internet, electronic games, and I'm sure we could say other things uh, that people are in bondage today. I think some people is in bondage to sports, don't you? Yeah. There really is. And I, uh, my son Johnny, he told me one time we was talking about teachers and being dedicated, and he said, Dad, he said, you know what? He said there's a lot of teachers, and you can call it dedication if you want, but actually their teaching prayer has become their religion. And they're in bondage to that, and they just completely sold their life out to, to their occupation and what they're doing in school mm -hmm. with children and so forth. And so uh, there's a lot of things that people can be in bondage to. Uh, we can look around us and we can see that there are things that is spiritual bondage that maybe could affect some Christians. And so as we look at some of these things, I've made a list of some, and again, I'm sure you could add to it. Now this would not be Christian, the first two I have here. Well, actually, I th three things that I have here that's really not Christian. And one thing that people gets in bondage to is the occults, the occults. Now there's a difference between, in our society, what is called cult and occults. There's a difference between that. Uh, if there's a group that calls themselves Christian that we don't think is really practicing Christianity and can be really identified as Christian, we call it a cult religion. But the occult is a satanic-based practices and, and, uh, and those kind of things. And so it it will involve involve witchcraft and satanic rituals and a lot of things like that. And there's people that's really in bondage to these things. I know, I know a man that pastors a church, and he there was a couple that uh, he had become acquainted with. He had began to uh, talk to them about the Lord, and I don't know what their relationship, why they was in touch with each other, but anyway, they'd become friends. And this lady was into some kind of a spiritualism, something or other, and she was always talking about that, and he was always talking to her about the Lord, her and her husband. And so after this went on for a while, she said something about uh, her religious practice and so forth, and he asked her the question. He said, called her name, and he said, I just want to ask you something. He said, how are you doing with that, and what is that doing for you? And he said she had the strangest look on her face, and she said, well, actually, it's not doing very good. And he said, well, I'll tell you what. He said, uh, I want to challenge you to try Jesus and see how that will do for you. And so they began to talk, and she began to listen and whatever, and her and her husband got saved. 
and now they're doing missionary work over in Bosnia, I believe it is, uh, which is not a very good place uh, to live uh, with what's going on over there. But they've been over there for at least 20 years that I know of, uh, that they've been over there working for the Lord. And so that, uh, but she was in, a, in an occult, which was very sat satanic and so forth. And so uh, he, he was able to lead them to the Lord. Now, there is some bondage that resists, that exists within Christianity. Uh, people that are actually saved and people that actually know the Lord, I think for the most part, I'm speaking in generalities here, but there are church groups that is in bondage. Some churches, and, and, and when you look, it's amazing how many churches are in bondage to legalism. Legalism, and that's when, boy, you live by a bunch of rules, and, and you have to go by those rules, and, and they just, the leaders in these groups just lays the law down to you. And I could name you several groups that's into that type of, uh, of religion, and it's, it was worse years ago than it is now, actually. Uh, and there's people that is in bondage to Sabbath keeping, Christian groups. Now, I recall talking to a lady one time, and, and uh, we, we got to talking about the Lord, and she said, oh, she said, John, she said, I just love my Sabbaths. I just love my Sabbaths. And I said to her, I said, I just love my Jesus. And she just looked at me so funny. She said, well, I love Jesus, too. <laughs> so, <laughs> but, uh, uh, but, 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 but. That was the main thing in her life. It really was, was Sabbath keeping. I mean, that was, she was so into that. And then there's groups that's in bondage to the Mosaic Law that are Christian groups, Christian people. And uh, I, I, I know when I was growing up, there were some of the churches, uh, we went to a lot of different churches because we moved around quite a bit in growing up and, and, uh, and so forth. But. Uh, I recall that uh, there was some of the groups that uh, they actually practice going practice uh, living Sunday, and what they call that God's Sabbath, and they said that Sunday was God's Sabbath, and so uh, we can't do any work on Sunday, and all we can do is go to church and and uh, read the Bible and and talk about the Lord, and that's all we can do on Sunday. And uh, we went to a couple of churches that was into that. I hated that. I really hated that. We couldn't play any sports on Sunday. All the other kids out having fun, playing sports and doing things, but we couldn't because of this bondage, this Sabbath day bondage. And only it was, they said that the Lord changed the day from Saturday to, su to Sunday on the cross. Well, I don't believe that for a moment. I really do not. I don't think there you find any scripture that will embrace that uh, idea. And so there's a lot of, of bondage within Christianity, and I'm sure there's others besides this. So I want to talk about the law for a little bit here. Let's go to uh, Galatians chapter 3, and that's the, that's the best chapter in the Bible, I think, when it comes to the law. And let's see what the Bible says about the Mosaic law, and it says a lot more than what I have here in my, my message this morning. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 19, it says, Wherefore then serveth, serveth the law? Why was there a Mosaic law? Why was it given? Why did God give the Mosaic law to Moses, the rules? Uh, uh, you know, when the children of Israel left the Egyptian bondage, Moses led those people out of that bondage and across the desert to the promised land. And, uh, of course, we know he didn't quite make it to the promised land, that Joshua finished his, his mission for him. But when we look at this, we find that Moses here was uh, the leader of about three million people out through the desert. They had no uh, permanent way to furnished food for them to eat and clothing and so forth. And uh, here was a people that did not have any law. And I'm talking about civic law, like the law of the land that we live by. And they had no real solid religion. 
uh, as far as we know. Uh, there was a people that they needed just about everything in their life, and uh, the Lord was so merciful. The Bible said their clothes didn't wear out, their shoes didn't wear out, uh, but they just went and they ended up spending 40 years in the, in the wilderness out there. Actually, I'd call it desert, but uh, it's, uh, here they was out there and living all those 40 years because of unbelief. They could have made that trip in, what, three weeks? Something like that. It was real. Eleven days, I heard from Eleven, 11 days, days, I know, it's a real short period of time they could have made that. But because of their unbelief, they wasn't allowed to go in. But that's another story. So, so what service the law? Well, the Mosaic law was their civic law, their spiritual law, their dietary law, everything that they needed. And it was given to the nation Israel exclusively. Now this law, that Mosaic law, was not given for anybody else except the nation Israel. And that was all. And so here it says what service the law. And it said it was added because of transgressions. It was added because of transgressions. So these people was not living a godly life and so they was given a bunch of rules to live by. And uh, to tell them how they was to treat one another, how they was to worship God. And, and it also included a lot of things that they needed to do that was a shadow of better things to come in the future. And so when we look at this, it said it was added because of, of transgressions till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. It's talking about the Abrahamic promise. And so it was given until the seed should come. Uh, to whom the promise was made. And it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. So as we go down to verse 24, it says, Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. Not by keeping the law, but by faith in Christ Jesus. So if you have confidence in Christ and live by the things he taught, you're going to find righteousness and you're going to find a great relationship with God, which the children of Israel did not have before the cross. They did not have the relationship with God that you and I have today. And so as we, as we look at this, it says that the law was a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. And, uh, and, and when it refers to the seed, uh, we find that the seed is talking about Jesus. When, the, when you read the Abrahamic covenant, the covenant was a contract. That's what the word covenant means, is a contract or an agreement. And so it says in there that the contract was, was between God and Abraham and his seed. So it wasn't just between God and Abraham, but it was also between God and Abraham's seed. Now we, you might say, well, that's talking about his biological offspring. Yes, it was, but also it carried on into the New Testament. And the Bible is very plain that when it talks about the seed, it's talking about Jesus. Jesus is the seed. Uh, so we find that uh, uh, people was, uh, uh, was, a lot of things wasn't very good with them. Let's see. Uh, I want to continue reading here in the book of, uh, back to the book of, of John, the eighth chapter. And, and let's continue the conversation after they said that they were Abraham's seed. Uh, and were never in bondage, this is what Jesus said to them. I know that you are Abraham's seed, that is, after the flesh, but ye seek to kill me because my word hath no place in you. Now, here's something that's very interesting that I think that we should realize. And that, it, it says this, it says that they was bragging because they was Abraham's seed. They was descendants of Abraham. Okay, did you know there's a scripture that says that the flesh profiteth nothing? It doesn't make any difference what your DNA is, what your ethnicity is. 
I've got a friend that uh, uh, he changed from Christianity to start practicing Judaism. And so I was talking to him and he told me, he said, uh, that I have some Jewish blood in my veins. And I looked at him and I said, you know what? I said, what kind of blood you have makes absolutely no difference. The only blood that is important is what Jesus shed on the cross for the sins of the world. Uh, that's what I told him. And he just had a, a funny look on his face. I guess nobody had told him that before. Uh, so uh, the flesh profiteth nothing. And, and I know that there's a big deal in Christianity today that people is talking about the Jews over there in the Middle East and all concerned about them. And, and uh, they... they uh, it's amazing how many people, how many Christians believe that those people over in the Middle East is, is still God's chosen people. Did you know that's not true? That's really not true at all. And I, my book is going to be published shortly, I hope. Uh, and, and I explain this whole thing in my book about, uh, about that and who the real Israel is and, and, and all of that. Uh, so let's continue here in verse 38. And Jesus said, I speak that which I have seen with my father, and ye do that which you have seen with your father. They answered and said unto him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said unto them, if ye were Abraham's children, ye would do the works of Abraham. And I put in parenthesis here, a tree is known by its fruit. And we are identified by the fruit that we produce. It's, it's about the way we live and the kind of personalities we have, what our attitudes are, and those things. That's what identifies us. It doesn't make any difference uh, what uh, nationality we are or ethnicity or, or any of those things. What's matter is that what really matters is the condition of our heart and whether we're pleasing God in the way that we treat other people and, and the way we treat one another. So uh, verse 40 says, but now you seek to kill me, a man that hath told you the truth, which I have heard of God, this did not Abraham. You do the deeds of your father. Then said they unto him, We be not born of fornication. We have one father, even God. I wonder when they made that statement. We're not born of, of, of uh, fornication. I wonder if they had reference to the birth of Christ and was accusing him being an illegitimate child. Do you suppose that's what they, what, and this was a kind of a cheap shot that they, that they had at that time? Uh, interesting, isn't it? Uh, I don't really, I, I think they really didn't believe that Jesus was born of a virgin. I, I don't think they believed that. And so uh, I can see where it could be a cheap shot that they threw at him. And then he said, Jesus said in verse 42, he said unto them, If God were your father, you would love me, for I proceeded forth and came from God. Neither came I of myself, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech, even because you cannot hear my word? Ye are, uh, we are, now I tell you, you talk about plain preaching uh, and plain speaking here. Look at verse 44, what Jesus told these people. He said, You are of your father the devil. Well, that's pretty plain, isn't it? That's pretty bold language to speak there. And I tell you, preachers wouldn't say that to people today. They'd be afraid of losing some membership or something, uh, probably. Uh, and sometimes I think ministers are too careful. Uh, I hope that doesn't include me, but I'm sure it does sometimes, uh, uh, about offending people. And uh, I heard about a case where uh, an evangelist was scheduled to speak in a certain church, and as he as he came to be to at, to the church, the the uh, the pastor uh, said, uh, "Well, he said, you know, he said, I want you to feel free, but I don't want you to offend my people when you're preaching for us." And that that evangelist looked at him and he said, "You know what, pastor?" He said, "If I don't offend somebody, I'm not doing you any good. People needs to be told the truth, even if you step step on their toes." And I like what. Sister Sharon shared with us uh, about the preacher in Texas. He said, uh, uh, I don't mean to step on your toes. I was aiming for your heart. 
Uh, and that's really our goal, isn't it, as pastors if, and preachers, if we're really, uh, if our heart's in the right place. Our goal is to help people, not to uh, discipline them and, and be cruel, but uh, we want to, we're here, we're here to help. And that's my job, is to help you in your walk with God. And uh, so... Step on our toes all you want. <laughs> okay. Uh, let me see, where did I quit reading here? Uh, you are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. Now that's quite an indictment that Jesus made concerning the devil, and then told these people that they was the children of the devil. So he was saying that that's how they was like that. And so, let's go just a little bit further. And because I tell you the truth, you believe me not. Which of you convinces me of sin? And if I say the truth, why do you not believe me? He that is of God heareth God's word. Ye therefore hear them not, because you are not of God. Then answered the Jews and said unto him, Say we not well that thou art a Samaritan and hast a devil? Uh, these were just plain statements that wasn't true. Uh, have you ever noticed sometime if you're discussing, or let me use the word debating with somebody, and, and you get the best of them, how they will change the subject and start making accusations and, and personal attacks and, and all this sort of thing because they just... Uh, feel like they have the, the last word. Uh, you know, I, a man told me one time, he said, I, I uh, had the last word with my, with my wife last night. She said, shut up, and I said, yes, dear. So he got the last word in. But uh, uh, Jesus said, I have not a devil, but I honor my father, and you do dishonor me. So, Jesus said, if you continue in my word, uh, then you're my disciples. He also said in our text, he said, learn of me, and I'll make your yoke easy. Uh, it's, it's a wonderful thing uh, to be a Christian and to live for the Lord. And it's a wonderful to have the Lord on our side and have him taking care of us and answering our prayers and supplying our needs and all of that, and we, we receive all of that by being part of God's family and living according to the teachings of our Heavenly Father, don't we? I mean, it's about that, and, I, uh, and I've made this statement several times that I'm a, a, a great believer in, uh, what's the word? I hate it when this happens to me. Uh, Cause and effect. <coughs> I never thought of it. I'm a great believer in cause and effect. I really am. And and if we if we follow the Lord and His teachings, uh, then we it will affect us in a great way. And so we need to learn about the Lord. That's why we need to come to church and be in Bible study and and uh, in Sunday uh, worship so we can hear the Word and and that we can know just what uh, God expects from us and how we can have a better life and, and uh, be treated better and so forth. Wouldn't it be great if everybody in the world would just embrace the teachings of God and live by them? Wouldn't that be a wonderful thing? Why we could just stop all the wars that's going on and use all the billions of dollars that is spent uh, on war machinery and all of that and spend that on the benefit of people uh, to eat better and live better and and all of those things. Wouldn't that be a great world if that, well, you know what? I believe there's one like that coming uh, where it's, everything's going to be great and going to be wonderful. I wish the Bible gave us more information on what eternity was going to be like when we, when we uh, are ushered into eternity. I just believe it's going to be the... The greatest thing, I believe, is going to be greater than our minds can even imagine. The scripture says, I have not seen and ear has not heard, neither has it entered into the, the, 
the heart of man and the great things that God has prepared for us. Uh, that statement was actually made to the people of the Old Testament, and I believe it was relevant to the New Testament, uh, but I believe it also extends on past uh, the coming of the Lord when we'll have our final relationship with God. So this morning, let's be disciples of the Lord. Let's learn of Him. Let's apply it all to our lives. And, and uh, you know, Jesus said, Come unto me, all you labor and are heavy laden. And if we do, we're going to be blessed people, more so than we even are now, I believe. And I believe we are a blessed people now. I believe we have a great church and a great group of people. So let's all stand this morning. Let's look to the Lord and... and uh, I think the food will be on the table in just a few minutes and we can have some food and some fellowship and, and, uh, and, and just enjoy the rest of the day. So I'm going to ask uh, Joe if he would dismiss us and bless our food this morning. Thank you, Lord, for the great service we had. Bless the food and let us have a good day. Amen. Amen.